to what is called the common ion effect. And so um, what I'm going to do is pull the assignment slide up. So if you're like, oh, there's no way she can get through this. Well, I went ahead and I have selected some problems that will be due Friday. Okay, just because I care. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off with this idea of chemical equilibria can be expressed using an equilibrium constant expression. Okay, so it's the products raise their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the reactants raise their stoichiometric coefficients. And I'll kind of show you how it relates to this idea of trying to dissolve a trying to dissolve a solid solute in solvent, like water. Water is a great solvent. So we can talk about the solubility of a solute in terms of just some just non-specific terms. No, no number here. We can say it is infinitely soluble, which is kind of weird. Like even if you were, and I did it here in uh, my physical science class this morning because we were talking about solutions. Even if you took water and added sugar, you know, that's your solution. At some point, you're going to reach the maximum solubility. So to say something's infinitely soluble, you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. Okay. So infinitely soluble, highly soluble, um, soluble, moderately soluble, sparingly soluble, and insoluble means it doesn't dissolve. But honestly, the type of problems that we need to talk about today are dealing with insoluble salts. So even though they say they're insoluble, they're just, just a tiny bit actually goes into solution. I kind of can get you how that works. Um, sometimes you'll see um, like uh, kind of abbreviations <coughs> for these uh, with regard to the solubility, usually solubility in water. So what's an example of something that's infinitely soluble? I think instead of a solute like sodium chloride, like a sugar, mm -hmm. I think they're probably saying uh, some liquids can be infinitely soluble. Right. I can think of, you know, um, water and the you know, two polar things would be mm -hmm. infinitely soluble. But I can't think of a solid that would be infinitely soluble. I'm just not seeing it. <laughs> um, but instead of kind of these vague sort of terms, here in a minute, we're going to put some real numbers to it. All of them. Now, there is this general thing called, um, how do I say it, again, without the numbers, just looking at an ionic compound saying, well, will that dissolve in water? And that's what these slides talk about. Um, I actually, I'll give this to you now. And sometimes I have some questions on the test over this. I hate these. It's like, um, so what? So all salts of sodium, potassium, lithium, and ammonium are soluble, okay? And almost all salts of those polyatomic ions are soluble. Um, then it says uh, most salts of those halides are soluble. And then it gives the exceptions. It's the exceptions that give you every time. So you're like, all right. So if you take any cation, the way this works, if you take any cation and join it with chlorine, bromine, and IV, any metal, you're like, oh, it must be soluble. Unless that cation is silver, mercury one, or lead two. I just hate those. You know what I'm saying? I'm not good with I don't memorize things well. That's not my thing. Not my problem. Um, so sulfates, most are soluble unless it's calcium sulfate. Insoluble, strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, silver sulfate, mercury sulfate, lead two sulfate. So these guys would be insoluble. Um, so salts of these polyatomic ions listed down here, anions, these polyatomic anions. If you have a, a metal with these guys, it's going to be insoluble unless that that cation is uh, sodium, potassium, lithium, or ammonium. I don't have any good way to memorize these. I've said that lately, I don't to tell you. But the sheet I gave you actually is um, this sheet, which kind of gives you some ideas. See, to me, there's no logic here. And I keep complaining about this. What I would do if I was y'all was look at it before you come to your, come to your test. Okay, so you go, just general rules. Okay, and if you find a good way to learn them, let me know. Don't you hate what you say? I don't know how to teach it, but yeah, it's memorization. So now on to something that's not memorization, something that you can sink your teeth into. Okay, so I want to deal, we're dealing with the topic of salts that are insoluble. And not even just sparingly soluble, but insoluble. And so, um, 
I would picture it kind of like this. Where here's your beaker, okay? And here's your water, here's your sludge at the bottom. Okay, this is my solid sludge. And I think what you need to think of is like there's, well we said that this dissolving process is dynamic. So you have some of the sludge um, going into solution and some of the sludge precipitating back out. We know that, right? But you have to kind of think if it's insoluble, basically you have a speck here. These would be my solute particles. Okay, so kind of think of it like that. If it's insoluble, that's the situation. Um, and if it's insoluble, you're gonna see how it relates to uh, uh, chemical equilibrium that we've been talking about. So yeah, this beaker is that beaker. So here's the sludge at the bottom. You can see the crystalline structure. Um, and here you see it actually, those cute little waters of hydration have carried some of the cations and the anions away. Insoluble. And to me, it's kind of weird because you say insoluble should be not soluble. That's soluble. Anyway, it's just a little bit soluble. And this actually, in your uh, Chapier's, uh, <coughs> uh, when you guys did your equilibria, do you remember when you took, was it silver nitrate and sodium chloride? Silver nitrate and sodium chloride, and you got the white precipitate? So silver chloride is insoluble. And so that's what you saw. All right, so how does this have to do with chemical equilibria? Well, I know this looks like real mathy, but it will, it will be just fine. This over here at the left would be your insoluble salt, and it's in equilibrium to a certain extent with dissolving in water. So that's what you see on the right side. Okay, dissolving in water, insoluble salt, this is your sludge. And it breaks down into the little subscripts X and Y would be like how many of those cations you get and how many of those cations you get. So you can see the subscript became a coefficient, okay, and cleverly so, the charge of the, the magnitude of the charge of the cation actually is how many anions you have, and that's sweet. And then uh, magnitude of charge on the anion is how many cations you have. It's kind of like the crisscross we talked about before. Um, so this is an equilibrium. We can go ahead and put it in this form, but we said that solids don't appear, and we actually did some of these before. So it's products over reactants, so this is what it becomes. So it's products over reactants and solids don't appear. So here we go. It's the molar concentration of the products raised to stoichiometric coefficient. That's what you see there. But, and I kind of complain about this, and it's correctly so, it's not a KC, it's a KSP. KSP is the um, equilibrium constant if you're dealing with an insoluble, uh, in, insoluble equilibrium, okay? So don't blame me. All right. So um, equilibrium constant, KSP, must be dealing with an insoluble salt. Um, and we actually give that a uh, special name. It's called the solubility product constant, but it's an equilibrium constant. It's just the solubility product constant. Um, we are gonna link here momentarily with the, the degree of solubility, like how many milligrams of, of solute can dissolve in 100 milliliters of water, or that's solubility, versus the solubility product. Now, you'll hear me, um, did I bring my, no, uh, I, my pen is in my office, I think, but you'll hear me uh, talk about the solubility product, and I'll call it solubility product constant, that's KSP. Make sure we're all on the same page here. Change it to a specific equilibrium, where I'll just put it this way. I'll give this, this, I don't know, um, then the KSP equilibrium, um, the, this is the solubility product. And sometimes you'll hear me call it solubility product constant. Um, so it's the molar concentration of the reactants. Or excuse me, yeah, the products. 
And since that's a solid, it doesn't show up. All right. So the solubility then is, like I said, um, we, you guys have done problems with solubilities before, and usually it's like X grams per 100 milliliters of water. That's solubility. This is a solubility product constant. And they are related, but I'm going to kind of show you how they are related coming up. So let's do an example. Um, let's write the equilibrium constant expression or the solubility product constant expression for silver chloride. So the stoichiometric coefficients of the silver and the chloride ion are both 1. So the KSP expression, that's what I call it too, the KSP expression or the uh, solubility product constant expression is just simply that. Um, life gets a little more interesting when we have um, more than one particle on the product side. Uh, the formula of this ionic compound is Ag3PO4 silver phosphate. So you know then, and this is where you have to kind of keep your wits about you, what we talked about in Chem 1, that we're going to get three Ag pluses and one PO4, three minus. So very common mistake is we don't get that memo. Because now with this information, we know we can write the KSP expression like this. Will be the silver chloride, excuse me, the silver ion uh, molar concentration cubed times the phosphate ion concentration raised to first power. Okay. Um, this is showing you um, we have two clear solutions. This looks like it's silver nitrate, and this guy is sodium iodide. So in Chem 1, we talked about exchange reactions. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The cation, the silver, is going to go with the iodide. And the cation here, the sodium, is going to go with the nitrate. Okay. So the deal here, then, is if any one of those two things are insoluble, if either, did you catch that? If either silver iodide or sodium nitrate is insoluble, that's what's going to happen. So you can see, actually, then, one of them was insoluble. And if you go back a few slides to the solubility rules that I gave you, um, as it turns out, sodium nitrate, totally soluble, silver iodide, insoluble. So the way these problems, when it works in problems, work then is after the exchange reaction, which isn't an equilibrium, it's just a swapping of cation anions, after that <coughs> happens, then we focus on the one that, that <coughs> precipitates out. And we, we run with it to work the problem. So here's the silver iodide. Notice we um, need to write the KSP expression for this. would be KSP is equal to the molar concentration of AB plus times the molar concentration of I minus. One of the things we've been talking about with KC equilibrium constant was the higher the equilibrium constant, that means it favors the product side. Okay? So we have these small equilibrium constants, these small solubility product constants. So that means that it favors the reactant side. And what is the reactant side? It's our solid. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. So we get a sense for um, how much will dissolve. So this one, this aluminum hydroxide, has a crazy small one. That means it doesn't dissolve very much, right? Um, this copper, copper one chloride, um, relative to the aluminum hydroxide, it's larger. I know that they're pretty small, 10 to negative 6, but 10 to negative 32. Okay, so this one actually, you think, well, it might be more, a little more soluble. Um, here's a, from a different textbook some, um, these are KSPs, some solubility product constants. And in each case, there they have the same form. On the left is the solid, okay, and on the right, then actually are the, the ions that it breaks into. And I think some of the homework that's going to be due Friday, you're going to take things like silver chromate, and you're going to write the KSP expression for it. Again, a real common mistake is we lose sight of those stoichiometric coefficients become powers in our equilibrium constant expression. All right. So let's work a problem. We'll focus on lead to chloride. Uh, I might go grab my pen because I miss it. So I can write on these. Um, hold that one. 
Are you still here? <laughs> yeah, we got kind of lost though. That's <laughs> like. I can read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you can help me lost. <laughs> As a guy, like, like, trying to like, try to try to keep up, like try to figure out what she's saying. Like, okay, so like, I can't even like describe. I was just trying to explain my question with the arrows, and I was like, so I was like, oh, okay, so she's saying, then I had to like keep trying all these different things to try to make, like, make sense, and then she moved on to the next. Don't put that in the top. So, lead to bride, relatively insoluble salt, temperature given. We're supposed to knock out its KSP. So what's given, its solubility is given, so we're supposed to come up with a value for its solubility product constant. Um, one of the things that uh, you really need to get in the habit of doing for this sort of problem is taking the lead to chloride in this example and writing the equilibrium. So that's to say in its solid state, it would ionize or dissolve. And we get one particle of lead 2 and two particles of the chloride ion. Again, that's going to be important for writing the equilibrium constant expression, solubility product constant expression. So there's your KSP expression. We can't go wrong in writing that equilibrium. So for this one, it's a little straightforward, I think, in that um, we were given the, the solubility. And so this, yeah, I guess I don't need my pen. Notice how I wrote this is the solubility that was given, right? 0 0.0162 moles per liter. That's as much as you can make it dissolve. Well, we know when that ionizes or dissolves, then we, the molarity of your lead 2 is going to be the same because stoichiometry is the same. But what about the molar concentration of your chloride ion? It's going to be twice that, exactly. So this is one of those where I didn't write it out with stoichiometric ratios. I just kind of eyeballed it. So if you start out with, if uh, again, if 0 0.0162 moles per liter of the salt is going to dissolve, that will give you this relative molar concentration of your two ions. And then you see where I'm going to go with this? Then all you got to do is plug those into here. Equilibrium constant expression, your solubility product constant expression. And then you're done. So here's your KSP expression. Uh, plugging in for the lead to 0.0162, plugging in for your chloride ion 0.0324, and we have to square the molar concentration of your chloride ion because that's the stoichiometric coefficient. Three sig figs. So you're looking at uh, solubility product, product constant of 1.70 times 10 to the fifth. Again, those are unitless, just like um, KCs are unitless. Not bad. Okay. So, your solubility products, um, they can be used to estimate how much of a salt will dissolve, to what extent it will dissolve. Um, if it's a very... Uh, we're going to do this sort of problem on a Friday, maybe Monday, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where you can use the, the KSPs to determine whether a precipitate will form or not. <coughs> excuse me. If a precipitate's going to form, they can, if you have more than one option for things precipitating out, you can use your solubility products to know which one's going to come out first, which, which usually cation, I guess it could be anion, that's going to precipitate first. Uh, we do a lot of um, solubility products are about a little over room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, and there's more if you need them. 
Oh, see, now this is why there's just a lot of papers here. Those are very small values, but you have these in your OpenStax books too. Hope you don't need to go refer to those. They're pretty small. All right, let's do another one, shall we? Now this one's a little different, and this one is backwards. We're given the solubility product, and we're supposed to knock out the molar solubility. Um, we can do that. So uh, what I told you before was uh, given a, an insoluble salt problem, you can't go wrong by taking calcium carbonate, which is what we're going to do, and show the equilibrium has it dissolves. Okay. So you can't go wrong in doing this. And from this, we can write the KSP expression would be this. Or the stoichiometric coefficients of your calcium carbonate are both 1. So, and the 2.8 times 10 to the minus 9, that was given in the original problem. This one, um, I've done it differently different semesters, but I think I like doing an ice table, an ice chart. So we'll see what you guys think. Um, so if we let X be equal to, basically it's molar solubility. X is the amount of, of calcium carbonate that is going to dissolve. X is going to dissolve, and then in this case, X is going to form, and X is going to form. Okay, so we could write uh, an ice table kind of like this, where we have initial, the reason I like using an ice table for a problem like this is it's going to help with the, what we say, I call the common ion effect coming up. So in this case, we were putting it in pure water. Since it's pure water, I don't have any calcium ions, shouldn't anyway, and I shouldn't have any carbonate. By definition, since X is my molar solubility, sometimes I do it this way. So I'm going to put an X under calcium carbonate. I'm going to put a minus X and I'm going to plus, plus X and a plus X there. It's the same thing. So X is my molar solubility. Um, then if I take the initial and apply the change at equilibrium, I have X and X. It'd be like, oh, Mrs. Snipes, I didn't think I'd have to solve for X. But this sort of problem you do. And it's not bad. I'm just going to take these X's, I'm going to plug it up there, and it looks like this. If I put an X there for my, cal my Ca2+, plus, an X there for my CO3 2 minus, it's X squared, right? So now I get X squared is equal to 2.8 times 10 to the minus 9. We can solve for X without using the quadratic equation. So round into two sig figs, take the square root of both sides, you get X is equal to... 5.3 times 10 to the minus fifth. And I went ahead and threw in units here because by definition, X was my moles per liter of uh, uh, um, uh, solute that would dissolve, my molar solubility. So that's it. So we uh, take that a little bit further. We're going to do a similar problem. Again, we're, we're after molar solubility. The KSP is given. It's exactly like we did before. But in this case, you're going to see it's a little complicated because of how the salt ionizes. So we're dealing with silver chromate and insoluble salt. So one of the first things you need to do is write the equilibrium. And from the equilibrium, write the equilibrium constant expression, or the solubility product constant expression. So in this case, we get two particles for two Ag pluses and one CrO4 2 minus chromate. So again, I know I keep saying it, but a, and I don't mean to say it so that we make that mistake, but a common mistake is not to recognize this, uh, the importance of the stoichiometric coefficients that come from the formula. So we write the KSP expression would be this. The molar concentration of the Ag raised to the second power times the molar concentration of the chromate raised to the first power. And again, your solubility product constant was given, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12. So we're after molar solubility. So again, I, what I, so if I let, and you're going to see on the next slide, if I let x be equal to molar solubility, I put a minus x there. 
Actually, here I'm going to put a plus 2x. I'm going to put a plus x here. Because you get two AGs pluses for every one AG2, zero, four. So my ice table looks a little different. So if we let x be equal to the molar solubility of the silver chromate, <coughs> bless you. We're dissolving it in pure water, and again on Friday, I'll kind of show you we aren't always dissolving in pure water, but um, water only, or pure water. So that's why these are zero, and yeah, the, I get 2x of uh, my silver because I have a coefficient of 2. All right. So now if we take these quantities, the 2x, plug it in there, and the x, plug it in there, it looks like this. Now, a, this is full of common mistakes, but a real common mistake would be, and we've done a little bit of uh, raising things to a power, when I square this quantity, I have to distribute it through. So don't forget, that's like 2 squared times x squared. Real common mistake. So let's go ahead and uh, kind of expand that all out. So if I take 2x quantity squared times x, I get... 4x raised to the third power, 4x cubed, is equal to that Ksp. And again, do not need the quadratic to solve that. We are going to have to take a cube root. So we need to get find out what the x is because that's our molar solubility. So we can do it in one fell swoop this way. x would be equal to the Ksp, that 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12, um, divided by 4. And then all raised to the, take the cube root of it. And you could have written this, this could have also been, sometimes you've seen it written kind of like this, I think like this, I don't know, cube root. Or I think it's easier on the calculator to raise it to the one third power. The square root is raised to the one half power. Cube root raised, uh, yeah, to the one third power. So anyway, two sig figs, and you're going to come up with 6.5 times 10 to the minus fifth at, for a value of x. I'm going to go ahead and slap units of molarity there because that is our um, molar solubility. That's how much of that insoluble salt would dissolve in dynamic equilibrium. Okay. All right. So a little bit ago, I kind of compared the KSP values directly, like magnitude 10 to the negative 38 that really doesn't dissolve much versus 10 to the negative 6 that does dissolve more. But be careful about that. Um, so for instance, uh, using that kind of pattern, we might look at these, um, these uh, solubility product constants and say, well, the smaller one, the silver chromate must be less soluble because it means we know that the Kc or the Ksp favors the, the, the reactant side even more, so less soluble. But here's what we come up with with their molar solubilities. Uh, the molar solubility of silver chromate actually is a little more soluble. Okay, 6.5 times 10 to minus 5th versus 5.3 times 10 to minus 5th. So this is a case where the, the solubility product constant kind of says it should be less soluble, but it's more soluble. And it has to do with the number of pieces that it breaks up into. Okay, so in other words then, um, for all of these, uh, you know, silver chloride, silver bromide, silver iodide, they all have the same pattern. They all break up into uh, two particles. Well, in this case, we can compare the KSPs directly to know what their molar solubilities would be. In this case, the one with the smallest KSP would be the least soluble, and it totally is. But you can only compare them directly, apples to apples, if you have the same number of particles that um, are ionizing. 
So if you're looking for patterns, there definitely is a pattern. I mentioned kind of the number of particles it ionizes into. This is the first problem that we did, the pattern where we had it ionizing into one particle cation, one particle of anion. We came down with basically the, um, the molar solubility being x, okay? So uh, we came up with x squared is equal to the solubility prize. And then we did this one, this was our second one, a little bit different. I think we had maybe two particles of the cation, I don't know, but it could be the cation or the anion, and it works out the same. Um, and we end up uh, coming up with this, uh, 4x cubed is equal to the KSP, where x is the molar solubility. So we do have this pattern thing going on, but I usually, I'm not good with memorizing things, if you know. I can't memorize the solubility rules. Um, so I usually kind of leave with it. So here is where I wanted to get to. And it's not just a time thing, it's a kind of a, I want to switch gears on Friday to talk about the common eye effect. So if you would please uh, work, um, I don't know how you're going to do this, jot down. Let's see. You can say up to 15.15, so don't do 15.15. Do 15.1, 3, 8, 10, and 13. Hope that makes sense. And then save those others for the weekend. <laughs> okay. And that's it, man. Yes, it is, man. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like